So I was asked to talk a little bit about the future of teaching. Um, so I'll just uh, give a bunch of predictions and you, know, you can check back with me in 10 years and see which ones came, came true. Uh, so I think the future is quite bright. I think a lot of it's inevitable with or without Newton or any other particular, particular endeavor. I can talk a little bit about Newton, but um, I think that a lot of this will come true. Um, and that's where, you know, Wayne Gretzky is a famous hockey player um, in, from um, Sherry's home country. And he's, someone asked him what makes the greatest hockey players. And he said, the good hockey players skate to where the puck is now, but the great ones skate to where it's going to be. And they just know where it's going to be. They just see that three-dimensionally or, or four-dimensionally. And uh, you know, I think, I think it's not too hard to have some, some, um, some predictions about where the future of education is going to be in 10 years. Uh, I'm pretty sure I have a, a, I mean, I'm sure enough about my predictions that I've uh, devoted my life to it. But I think um, some a version of the following is, is bound to come true. And so you may as well, whether you're an entrepreneur or a policymaker, skate to where the puck is going to be. Um, so uh, the internet is going to transform education in the internet and mobile, the way it's transformed every other industry whose product can be re reduced to ones and zeros and sent over the internet. And by no means am I claiming that all of education can or should be reduced to ones and zeros and sent over the internet. But the facts of history um, uh, admit no exception to any industry whose product can in large part or the subcomponent of any industry whose product can in large part be reduced to ones and zeros, that landscape is laid waste to and rebuilt. There have been no exceptions. So if you are, um, um, and that's not to say that 100% of music or 100% of journalism is reducible to ones and zeros, right? Otherwise, um, great news anchors wouldn't have jobs. People want that feeling, that personal feeling, and that's why they, they still exist and will continue to. But the industry has been utterly transformed. Um, in those two cases, not, not uh, for the better in terms of the supply side, but probably for better in terms of the consumer. Um, in the case of um, travel or real estate, the information component of those otherwise very much bricks and mortar industries has been revolutionized. Right? So if there's a big information chunk, or if the product itself is largely information or information based, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that's going to stop it. There's no force in this world or anywhere else that's going to stop this transformation. It is happening. So what's it going to look like and how do you prepare yourself? Well, the internet does two things. It does distribution and data mining. That's all that it does. I've never heard anybody um, tell me a third thing that it does. It just does those two things. It just does them incomparably better for a digital product than anything we can do in the bricks and mortar world. So there's already distribution in education. There's already data mining in education. The data mining is standardized tests. It's bricks and mortar data mining that happens for one three hour window in your life in the States. I don't know how, much, how many standardized tests you have here. Um, but there's, standardized, there's big data in education already. It's standardized tests. And it basically works. Uh, there's lots of problems with it, but it basically works. And that's why it continues to exist. Standardized tests in the test, uh, standardized tests in the States um, people want to get rid of them for all kinds of political reasons, but the GMAT, LSAT, and MCAT, respectively, are still the single best predictor of first year grades in graduate school. And no one can dispute that. It's just a fact of statistics. So that's why people keep using it, despite all the political opposition. Okay, so that's just three hours of data once in your life. What happens when you can bring big data to education every single day? Because everyone knows that in 10 years, kids are going to do all their homework on tablets. There's not going to be any printed textbooks in 10 years, not in the rich countries, nor should there be. The printed textbook is a very poor form factor for any number of reasons, and you can probably imagine what some of them are. So when kids do all their, 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 their materials, the materials side of the industry, on tablets or similar devices, you can passively aggregate all their data. And they produce phenomenal quantities of data. Kids produce, students, well, they could be adult learners, students produce more data per day than Google, Facebook, um, and Netflix, and Amazon combined could get in their wildest dreams. And it's not even close. So this is what my company does. So I'll, I, I'm familiar with the numbers. So let me tell you that um, Netflix, Amazon, Google, Facebook, they, they get in the ones or tens of data per user per day. They get really very little data per user. My company, Newton, helps. We work with publishers and, and, um, and institutions. And we help them make their, their applications personalized. And right now, our most data-rich applications produce up to 10 million actionable data per user per day, per student per day. So we're getting five orders of, data, of magnitude more data than Google on a per user per day basis of actionable data. Next year our data scientists think will be in the billions. And it's not because it's not because of us in particular, it's because education just happens to be different from those other industries. Big data is about assessing chunks. And the chunks for Google and Facebook and Netflix are gargantuan. They're the they're the web page or the uh, movie or the product. Those are big chunks with poor correlations. Education just happens to be different. It has millions of minute chunks that every student every every atomic concept is a chunk. 
Every little thing that you do as a student is a chunk. There's millions of them, tens of millions, and they're very highly correlated with each other. So they just bleed a cascade effect, an exponential effect of additional inferred data. So you can just get extraordinary quantities of data, data the likes of which the world has never seen before for anything. And the education being so high stakes, if you can take all that data and you can figure out exactly what that kid should do next, if you know for a fact that that student is going to struggle next Thursday, there's no universe where that student isn't going to struggle on Thursday, because Thursday introduces concepts that build on concepts that you know that that student is weak at. And the traditional education assembly line model, kid gets to next Thursday, fails at some level, it may not feel like failure, but that kid has failed because that kid has sub-optimized his or her learning on next Thursday's content, concepts, and no one really knows that, it's not really visible to the teacher, the parent, or the student that, that, that he or she has sub-optimized her learning on that. Okay, but then everything that's a dependency on that, all the nodes that, are, that, are, that, that follow on after that, that are dependency, that have dependency on that cluster of concepts, she's gonna sub-optimize her understanding of all those too. And all this plaque builds up. By the time you get to college, you can't do math anymore. Calculus isn't hard. Calculus is easy. The problem with calculus is there's so much math built up in most people's heads by the time they plaque built up in most people's heads by the time they get to college that they just can't really understand it very well. Anyway, so that's um, so in in ten years you'll have kids who just in their materials in their kind of tab or base textbooks they're going to get exactly what they need. Some kids will have more homework, some will have less, and it's just if we're not going to let them get to Thursday and then fail. We're going to know in advance they're going to fail, and we'll prevent it from happening. So we can do that. In fact, we do that right now. And by 10 years, it'll be commonplace, if not, if not five years. We can also measure things like there's been a lot of debate in the academic literature about learning styles, and no one really understands this stuff, because um, some, some serious th researchers believe that there's no such thing as learning styles, and that's, that's nonsense. The idea that every single student learns every single concept best in exactly the same way it doesn't even make any statistical sense. It's just it's it's a non it's nonsense. And yet people insist, serious people will insist that there's no such thing as learning styles. What and, and the reason for this is because as academic researchers have looked at learning styles, they have said we found no evidence of it. Okay, now if you're if you're an academic researcher at a university and you want to make a name for yourself, do you want to go out with a book or a paper that says there's no evidence of learning styles yet because our measurement tools are so poor? That doesn't make for a very good book. But if you come out with a, with a strong position that learning styles don't exist and all this stuff that people are doing in classrooms should be, should be stopped and it's, it's hurting our children, that is something you can make a personal brand off of. And that's, that's what's happened. And so people have come to believe in some circles that learning styles don't matter. But of course, of course they do. We just haven't had the measurement tools yet. And we will have the measurement tools very soon. So we can tell you things, and my company does this, we can tell you things right now, like you learn math best in the morning. You learn verbal concepts best in the evening. If you learn triangles best at 2.42 in the afternoon, we'll know that. If, you, if, you're, if lunchtime learning happens to be your lowest retention time of the day, we can tell you don't bother, go hang out with your friends, come back at some other point. We can, we can measure when kids start getting bored of any con given concept. You get bored of this one at 22 minutes consistently, you get bored of this one at 19 minutes, you get bored of this one at 35 minutes. We can measure that. If it's true, and it's not true of everybody, but where it is true, we know it, and we know it for a fact. So why give a kid more material at something at the 29 minute mark when you know that he's bored of it after 26 minutes? That's just a recipe for sub-optimizing engagement. So we can measure all that. We can measure things like um, if you give this child a practice question that is top 10th percentile difficulty level, she'll consistently quit. So you've got to give her a 60th percentile one first, then an 80th percentile one, and then you can get her up to the, to the top 10. Right? You can measure all those kinds of things. Um, so the future of teaching looks like, so here are my predictions about the future of teaching. Um, it looks like kids better ready for class. A lot of the teaching to the test now will happen passively, algorithmically, while they're doing their homework. So there'll be less pressure to teach to the test. Students should just come to class better ready with all the basic concepts. And then teaching in the class can be left to what teaching does best, which is things that a robot can't do very well. It's complex concepts. It's gray area concepts. So all the facts in of World War I, all the facts and the, and the concepts, the simple critical thinking skills, all of that can be taught better by a robot. But the causes of World War I, what makes human beings better than robots, that can only be taught by teachers. And, and inspiring a love of learning, that can only be done by teachers. And so the teachers will have um, the, the, the low value add stuff can happen at home better. And the high value add stuff can now be focused on more in the classroom. And that will be a wonderful transition for everyone if we get it right. It'll be, a, uh, it'll be challenging for some teachers who just want to go and, and uh, lecture and have kids do questions in class. Um, you're going to have more permeable membranes between uh, grades. So the, the fixed grade level will become quite, not, not quite as, um, as calcified. 
you'll have kids who go with a cohort. They'll have some classes that are a couple of grades ahead and some classes that are a couple of grades behind. That will become more fluid. They'll have more online classes. Some significant percentage of every student's day, might be 10% for some kids, might be 100% for other kids, will be pure, will live video online, purely online classes. And this will um, do a few things. It will give choice where choice doesn't really exist right now. So choice of all kinds of subject matters, choice of teachers. How am I doing? Oh, really? <laughs> I have like eight more predictions to go through. Okay. Um, okay, okay. Um, so what, much more choice. Also with more choice, you get more competition. If you have wonderful teachers over the internet, the best in the country for some subject matter, and your teacher locally is really quite poor. Now a local teacher in the room of the student should always be able to be a live video internet teacher, obviously. And if they can't, and in some cases, let's face it, they won't be able to, that's going to, be, um, that's going to create new competitive <laughs> pressures that teachers aren't used to. You also have some teachers that teach lots of these live classes, live online classes. Every school will be teaching live online classes and there'll be some credit acceptance scheme and that'll happen. Uh, and it'll, it'll happen for economic reasons because if some country or region resists it, the value creation in neighboring regions will be so great that eventually the political pressure will be such that they have to accept it. So that's going to happen whether people like it or not. There'll be widespread credit acceptance. There'll be lots of live online teaching, uh, primary, secondary, and higher ed. But that will create new competitive pressures for teachers as well because some of these teachers will be superstars online. They'll be adored by lots of students, and that will create un, 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 uh, unexpected competitive pressures. Um, <coughs> teachers will spend a lot less time creative, co creating content. OER is going to be something you hear a lot about, open educational resources. Um, there's a vast treasure trove of it. The data um, will help unlock what the best pieces are. Um, so a teacher will just be able to go online, say, I'm teaching ninth grade biology, and she'll be able to just get a whole list of the world's top <laughs> biology content created by other teachers. And it's top not because people are ranking it in, you know, in opinions or something. It's the top content because um, big data can tell you, for students in general, here's the top 10 pieces of content from around, around the world. For your students in particular, for high performing students, this is the best piece. For low performing students, this is the best piece. For students who need a blend of text and rich media, this is the best piece. 